you know what? I feel like at this point, we get it, okay? And you're probably reading the title of this video and you're like, Caleb, we get it. Bad boys are stupid and you think they're dumb. I feel like I can't not make this video today. You know what I'm saying? If you don't know what the frick I'm talking about, earlier this year, I made a video where I read a bad boy book. The book that I read is sitting right here and her name was Rescuing the Bad Boy by my homegirl Jessica Lemon. In this series, there is a book that is promptly titled A Bad Boy for Christmas. <laughs> and upon me seeing just that title, I knew that it was like my civic duty as a person who reviews stupid books to read this book and review this book, okay? So I know that I've made videos similar to this. I know that we're probably like over it at this point. Like honestly, me too. But I feel like my gift to you this holiday season is the fact that I bought this book and I read this book and I am here to share all of my thoughts with you today. I feel like after I review this book and after I get this video up, we're just gonna leave bad boys alone, okay? We're gonna find something else to make fun of. Maybe I'll read a cowboy book. Cause we have, randomly we have this book in my class. I don't, I'm freaking over it. Oh, oh. Before we dive deep into this journey together, I made a bunch of predictions on my phone about what I thought was gonna happen before I started to read it. And I'm gonna share them with you now so that when we read, we can try to check them off if they actually happened or not. My first prediction was weird euphemism about her being naughty. My second prediction was pretty basic and just a cliche, but it's that bad boy had as sick mother slash abusive father slash trauma. Sex scene where he's angry slash she cry because that's really hot to me. <laughs> Sex scene where she puts a Christmas bow on herself and then she's like naked and then she says, I'm the gift and then they have sex and it's not subtle at all. Then I think there's gonna be at least eight sex scenes because um, we just gotta get spicy up in here, you know what I'm saying? And then my final prediction is, um, just that directly in the dialogue, it's gonna say he was the bad boy. Now I think it's time for us to dive deep into high class literature. And, um, I'm so very excited. One of my favorite aspects about this book was probably the fact that the cover of this book actually showcases a bad boy. And my favorite thing about this bad boy is that when you look close enough, he has a double chin. Like, what can I say? He's just such a bad, bad boy. <laughs> So right away at the beginning of this book, everything is freaking boring. Like we, when I tell you we waste so much freaking time in this book, I'm not kidding. For so long, what we do in this book is we just like sit around and talk about nothing in particular. Fan favorites Donovan and Sophie are in this book, but they do not contribute a single thing. They're literally mentioned and they're like have conversations, but they don't do anything. They don't grow. They don't change. They just like are like, wow, we're here. It's personally really, really great. So on page three, our main lady, Faith, she goes into a spiel about how she just called off her marriage with her ex fiance named Michael. And um, here's what she has to say about that. What she wanted, what she needed, was to find her independence. She wasn't gonna rely on a man any longer. She was moving on. Her life had taken a turn, but not for the worst. And I think that's funny just because like, is this not a romance book? But also why does every single romance book have to be so insistent on the like the main characters not wanting to fall in love? Like there's been several books that I've read where they like immediately call off love forever and they're like, I don't want to fall in love. And then they do. And they expect it to be like a plot twist. But like, this is the romance. Faith declares that she is a single, independent woman. She's not wanting to fall in love. She's on her own. She's living her best life. Two paragraphs later, Faith is describing Connor's body in great detail. The way this man's muscular thighs filled out a pair of well-worn jeans. He moved with purpose. Not quite a stride, but more of an amble. Like, what? She says, a guy with that much girth should be a little bit less graceful. I have never once in my life seen a person and been like, wow, that is a lot of girth. 
I am sure that you should not be so graceful. Retweet if you have ever seen a big strong person and said, wow, that's a lot of girth. Y'all want to see some cute freaking scenes? So Connor calls Faith, I keep forgetting what her freaking name is. Connor calls Faith Cupcake because she has a sugar addiction. Do we see said sugar addiction ever in the, in the book at all? Does she ever eat anything sweet? No. But she loves sugar so much and her name is Cupcake because of that. But then guess what? Connor's nickname is Beefcake <laughs> because he loves beef. How come everybody in these books has like a food nickname? The patio door opened and Donnie and Sophie's big white and brown mutt Gertie strolled out. We got a cameo from my girl Gertie. <laughs> oh, Gertie. I miss Gertie so much. Hey, Gert. He ruffled the dog's fur. Something that became very apparent to me while reading this book is that like mass market romance books like these are not, I don't think, edited like nearly at all because there's like literally not even like a spelling or a typo mistake, but just something that as a fan of Lord of the Rings was very upsetting to me because there's this passage and they're talking about like this market, like this random freaking market that people go to i don't freaking know i don't care but they said the abundance market wasn't exactly mordor we love a lord of the rings reference but then she proceeds to have no idea what lord of the rings even is there were no gates no mouth of sauron sauron didn't have a mouth sauron very clearly had a big freaking eye because like it's an eye you know what I'm saying? You all remember that eye? But for some reason, she thought it was a mouth. Did she even read Lord of the Rings? She probably saw the movie and was like, what was that thing called? Mouth. If it was a mouth, he would be talking to them. He'd be like, what's up, y'all? It's me. But no. Jessica Lemon, girl, did you see Lord of the Rings? Or did you just, like, make that up? And why did nobody edit that out? <laughs> Retweet if you think that Sauron had a mouth. So our first plot point occurs on page 34. <sighs> I wanted to die up until this point, by the way. But our first plot point is actually pretty exciting. I actually thought it was a really good setup and I'm not just saying that ironically. They were at Sophie and Donovan's mansion and she's like, whoa, there is a scratching outside my house. I'm scared I'm gonna be murdered. And then they're like, okay, that was the end of that scene. And so she's like, whatever. It's probably just like a rat or something. I'm gonna go back to my apartment. So as she's walking out to her car, Connor, our bad boy, decides, you know what I'm gonna do? I'm gonna follow her to her car. And this is our first scene of him acting like a creep, which I thought was very, very fun. He says, where do you think you're going? Where am I going? She repeated. I'm going to get in my car and drive to my apartment and open a bottle of wine and watch something on my television because that's exactly how a normal person talks, right? And then he's like, I'm gonna follow you to your house and I'm gonna make sure that you don't get murdered. And then she's like, no, it's fine. He's like, no, you're gonna maybe get murdered and I need to be there to protect you. A firm hand wrapped around her upper arm and she tugged back. Oh my gosh, why does he have to grab her like that? That's what I don't get. So she's about to walk in her apartment. Tone low and serious, he said, I'm going first. Literally, what? Also, it is so freaking hot. I'm okay. oh, maybe not. Ooh, oh no. Oh no. Uh, whatever. Instead of just being like, okay, I'm gonna check it out. He decides to go around the backyard, okay? And he decides to scale his way up the balcony, like literally up the balcony. Because she lives in like an apartment, she's like upstairs. He scales like up the side of the building and then he like breaks into her apartment and then he lets her in and then he's like, wow, I can't believe this. I just broke in your apartment, which means somebody else theoretically could break into your apartment. Oh my God, get down before you kill yourself. Seriously, it was two stories. He might not die, but he would break his leg. He ignored her. No surprise there. I'm in your apartment. I see that, she says. Whoever was here last night didn't succeed in getting in, but I did. His scowl remained. I don't like that. I'm staying. 
You're staying? She blinked. Here? You have a couch. She heard like scratching, which implies like a, like a wild animal. And I don't know why he, his first thought is like murderer. So this is obviously the kickstart to our romance because the two of them don't want love. But now after the scary incident where she was almost murdered, they gotta stay together. I understand that these books are supposed to be like very sex heavy, with like sexual tension and like great details about everybody's crevices and holes and stuff. But I think what I realize is like my personal like turn on in these books is when they like communicate like normal freaking people. You know what I'm saying? Connor, for some reason, wakes up in the middle of the night and he's like, I gotta go out on this balcony. Gotta make sure nothing's going on. So he steps out onto the balcony and it says, a shadow stretched across the grass, visible even in the dark. Connor's spine snapped straight. Why does he act like a, like a stupid dog? Connor darted back into the apartment. What's going on? Faith was sitting up now, eyes wide open. Stay put and lock me out. Once his feet hit the grass, he took off at full speed in the direction he saw the figure vanish. After sprinting for about 30 yards, he came to a stop, putting his hands on his hips, which like, I understand that sort of him like racing out, not seeing anybody, having no idea where this figure went, and he was like catching his breath. But for some reason, I pictured it like a weird sassy like pose where he like runs out and then he's like, whew, wow. Where did he go? Homeboy literally ran like 90 feet. And then he's like, oh man, the figure got away. But I feel like he was just like so like out of shape where he's just like, whoo, whoo. Oh, I guess like, he's gone. Whoo. He walked back to the building still on high alert. Eyes peeled in case the guy was hiding around a tree or a car. Faith says, everything's okay? Everything's fine, he said. What happened, she asked. Dog, he hated lying. Cause he's like embarrassed that like, he's like too out of shape to like try to find this person. Which like, he'd never even saw a person. He said he saw a figure, which like still implies that there might be a rat that's just like outside of this place, but whatever. My first thought when he said dog was that maybe the person trying to break into the apartment is Gertie, the dog from, Hit book rescuing the bad boy. And I thought that maybe Gertie was gonna have like a villain arc and she was gonna try to like kill them. My second biggest prediction was maybe it was Santa. Maybe Santa was like, you know what? It's holidays, I gotta see what's going on. There's like this throwaway line, which I thought was really funny just cause it was kind of stupid. And it says, Connor had followed her to the restaurant like he followed her everywhere. <laughs> oh, wow. I really don't understand like why so many people think it's hot to have like some random person that you barely know follow you around to like wherever you freaking go. Ooh. For some reason, the character of Connor talks like he's a robot, which I really do appreciate because there's this really subtle scene where Faith is like, you don't have to sleep on the couch. Why don't you sleep in my bed? Ha ha ha. That's really subtle. Um, and then for some reason, Connor forgets that he's like a human being and he says, surprise you'd offer, but I accept. I'll sleep in your bed. Safer for you if I stay close. But like, what? Nobody talks like that. Like, why does he act like a robot? Beep boop, beep boop boop. You know what I'm saying? I don't get it. And also, I would love to mention the fact that we are 60 pages in and there have been no mentions of Christmas. Connor decides that he's going to interview every person that lives in the apartment complex with Faith to make sure they're not trying to break into her house. After a conversation with Faith's downstairs neighbor, Connor determined that the overnight... Sorry, I just realized I'm illiterate. After a conversation with Faith's downstairs neighbor, Connor determined that the overweight manager of a local Kentucky Fried Chicken, who was likely in his mid-50s, had not scaled the side of the building, hurdled the balcony wall, and Jimmy the lock on the patio door. Like, can you imagine having like a mutual friend being like, it's so weird. I heard like scratching outside my door and like a little bit of a jingle. I'm really confused. And then like some person that you barely know being like, okay, here's what we're gonna do. I'm gonna sleep at your house. I'm gonna scale your house, 
break into your house to prove to you that it is possible and then I'm gonna stay with you for several nights and then I'm also gonna interview every single person that lives in your apartment complex to make sure nothing's happening. And this is all in 60 pages, by the way, which is absurd. The KFC near my house actually did in fact burn down, so I will be praying for overweight 50 year old man and just hoping that nothing happens to him. I need you to pack a bag, cupcake. And she's like pouring her coffee. She's like, why? He's like, because it's Friday and I have somewhere I gotta be. Cause he's like going somewhere with his friend and they like meet every Friday. They were both in the war together in Afghanistan. Um, which I think is really funny because whenever they mention Afghanistan, the author like barely talks about it because you can tell that she doesn't know how war works. And then she's like, you want me to stay at your house? He's like, I want you to be safe. My house is safe. Pack your bags, cupcake. We're going to my house. I'm like continuing like addressing the fact that this boy seems like a psychopath just based on how like obsessed he is with the idea of someone breaking in. But like, you know what an easy fix is for this? is instead of just having Faith say like, yo, I heard like scratching and like a little bit of a jingle. Why don't you just have her say like, I saw a man on my balcony last night. I am terrified. That makes sense. But instead she's just like, I heard a little sound. And now this guy's like, oh, <gasps> she is gonna get murdered. And just like, it's like with simple editing, this book is like a 10 out of 10 in my heart. But no, know what we're gonna do? We're not gonna do that because that's too much work. Connor was around here. She knew. She swore she could feel him nearby. It was like a weird sixth sense. The air didn't exactly tingle, but parts of her did. I know what you're thinking. What are we talking about here? But you know what? I think that we're talking about baby. <laughs> what? I literally can't stand this. For this analogy, pretend that this is hard liquor. I don't know about you, but I personally think that the weird detailed descriptions of the main character's genitalia is quite endearing. Connor decides to install a literal like alarm system in her apartment. You are safe. If this alarm sounds, the cops will be called automatically. And then she's like, whoa, that's intense. He says, breathe cupcake, it's okay. She blew out a stuttered laugh. I am a coward. He didn't laugh with her. No, you are a woman who is dealing with an unknown intruder. You are not a coward. Shut up, idiot. I can't stand this man. But I just think it's really funny because uh, try to guess who is trying to break into apartment, okay? Like, we haven't met that many characters and all of the characters that we've met seem like pretty cool people. So as I said earlier, it's either Gertie or Santa, but I'm wondering if there's a figure in Faith's life maybe is mad at her for some reason. Perhaps an ex-fiance named Michael? Just to confirm this, there's this line of dialogue because uh, obviously everybody reading this book is a big stupid freaking idiot. Wouldn't surprise me if he was somebody she knew. I sure do wonder who it is that is trying to break into her apartment. A little bit later on in the book, we get this really cute scene where Connor intently stares at Faith doing yoga from across the room. And he goes for about two or three paragraphs where he describes a certain part of her body. Um, so what part of the body do you think he is staring at? But there are a lot of places to rest his eyes where her slender thighs met the swells of her perfect butt, and the way her legs tapered to delicate ankles, the way her ponytail practically touched the foot. wait, what? Her ponytail touched the floor? How long is this girl's hair? Oh, yeah, cause she's doing Downward Dog. Downward Dog? Whoop! What a misleading name. So, Connor McLean, bad boy supreme he's eating some ice cream in faith's apartment and so she said one bite please i am so very hungry and i am a skinny woman and i like sweets as established earlier when we had that passage that said she likes sugar and so then he says i'll give you some ice cream for a kiss and then she says a kiss 
The idea of it bounced around in her brain, and it grabbed onto parts of her she didn't want to acknowledge. Then he says, just let me have it. Oh, oh, sorry, no, that was actually, okay, that was actually Faith talking about the ice cream. That could have been really freaking bad. <laughs> like if he was screaming at her to give him a kiss, but no, it's her screaming at him for ice cream, which is wholesome. He remained unfazed. Sorry, cupcake, kiss for the rest. That's the deal. And then she says, I could get my own bowl. Dang, nothing's working. Just girl, just go get, just steal it. Like <laughs> what the frick? One quick peck was a small price to pay for deliciousness at the bottom of the bowl. She closed in and pressed her lips to his. Is that a cute scene? Or is that just stupid? Anyways, after our ice cream sexcapade, we go to sleep and guess what we hear out on the balcony? Somebody is out there, guys, and he's trying to get us. Wow. We have not had any scenes like this in the book so far. So Connor, our military man, is like, I'm gonna get whoever is up there. He says, with one hand, he slid the patio door aside and exited onto the balcony. He got lucky. The guy was scrambling over the railing as Connor reached him. So the intruder is wearing a mask, right? And I just thought to myself, is this the armed intruder? Atticus? Connor wrenched the mask off and revealed light brown hair, a fairly large nose, which I thought was a really important detail, and thin lips that peeled back and shouted, Get off of me! Help! Then Faith's voice rang in the air. Disbelief outlined two softly spoken syllables. Michael. Wow. How convenient is that? How convenient is that? What a surprise. I never would have thought that the person who was trying to break into her apartment and was maybe somebody she knew was their ex-fiance, Michael. Wow. Faith, help. Get this gorilla off of me. Wow, he called him an ape man. Connor says, talk to me, not her. Dickweed. <laughs> what is that? And I don't think I want to know what a dickweed is. Yeah, yeah. Michael is just like, I just came for the ring. Desperation replaced the terror in his voice. Ring? It was my great grandmother's and my, my mom was asking about it. She wants it back. And then Faith is like, oh, the engagement ring? I guess I never gave it back to you. So like, obviously you're gonna want that back, right? So we find out that all this boy wants is the engagement ring. And so that makes sense. Like that, the, he has a motive and like all that, that makes sense. But then Connor is like, he really like breaks this whole narrative apart because he just says, why didn't you call her? But then this man is just like, she changed her phone number. And I tried to text her, but I didn't have her number. You're telling me that this man couldn't have just knocked on her door and been like, yo, I'm so sorry. I know this is awkward, but I need that ring back. Um, whatever, that's a lot of freaking money. It's like a family heirloom and you called off our marriage. So like, what the frick? But no, he decides he's gonna wear a mask and scale up her balcony and like break in and take it. And it's literally justified in the text that that's a normal response to somebody changing their phone number. So they call the policeman over, his name is Brady. Um, he's irrelevant. So after they take Michael away, the policeman is like, yo, if like anything ever happens, just call me because I'm the police. And then Connor takes this as like some flirty gesture and he's like, no, you call me. Like. This is the police officer. What do you mean? You call me. You're just some random freaking guy. Sorry for the change in lighting. It just turned into night really freaking quick. But once the plot line about Michael trying to break into an apartment is wrapped up, we have a scene where it's Thanksgiving. And for some freaking reason, Faith goes with Connor to his family's Thanksgiving. So most of this chapter is just us being introduced to random freaking characters that we don't know anything about. We never see them again, but we know their entire lives, which is really, really exciting. My personal favorite line from this section of the book is this one right here. It says, the entire the entire table could have been a scene from the Norman Rockwell book she'd kept under her bed. 
O'Connor and Jonas were stationed in Afghanistan in a small village when an IED meant for the troops went off. Insurgents swarmed the area, but most of them were taken down. Three men in the unit were severely injured. Two died in the blast. Connor noticed, hunkered under the rubble, about to collapse. An Afghan woman with a toddler clinging to her leg. Before he thought of his own safety, Connor ran across the street to pull them out from under the unstable building. But that was when Jonas grabbed him and pulled him back from behind the vehicle. There was an insurgent running down the street with a gun. And then, like, the person with the gun kills the woman and the child. And then Connor's like, wow, I almost died. It's really dumb. So I guess one of my predictions did in fact come true. I know that it's literally been like 30 minutes into this video by now and you probably forgot about that, but guess what everyone? Bad boy has trauma. Now that Faith knows that bad boy is actually a sad boy, it's time to bang. Closing his lips over hers, he didn't let her say more, but let his kiss answer. He tucked her lithe I feel like that's not a word, but okay. He tucked her lithe body against his, tilting his hips into hers. When she pressed into him, he hardened in a second, doing his level best not to grind his... Merry Christmas, everybody! I thought it'd be really funny, instead of like reading you all the descriptions, because yikes to that, I would just read the dialogue because I think it's really funny, just like separated from like the paragraphs of context, so let's do it. Sensitive, he noted. Cupcake, I need you to open your eyes. No good, honey, he said. Your nipples are incredibly sensitive. A man making you keep them hidden, not giving them the attention they need, that's a shame. Sir, what the frick? He continued assaulting her nipple. 911, my nipple has been assaulted. So that was our first sex scene. I thought it was pretty fun. Uh, there's a lot of really, really fun descriptions. Immediately after that sex scene, we're immediately thrown into another sex scene one page later. So that marks sex scene number two. It's so weird to think that like literally minutes ago, I just said to myself, wow, there's been barely any sex scenes. By the time a loud growl reverberated from his lips over a pulse point on her neck, she threw her head back. Now, upon trying to figure out what the frick just happened in that scene, I don't want to let you know. How come every single bad boy that I've ever read about always growls like that? Like a wild freaking animal. So after sex scene two, immediately after, literally when I say one page later, guess what time it is, everybody? It's time for sex scene number three. Yeah, yeah. I'm just saying, he better call her naughty in this sex scene because that's the only prediction I'm hoping for at this point. Uh, but no, he doesn't. The only thing that's notable about this one is that there's a line that says, cupcake, he growled. Which like, what? Cupcake. 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 Like, I feel like that's just one of those words where like, just no matter what, you sound like an idiot. After we decorate for Christmas, guess what time it is, everybody? Boom, boom, boom. Sex scene number four. <laughs> the first sex scene in this book occurred on page 166. We're currently on page 188, which is 22 pages, and there have been about four sex scenes since then. Wow, that's too many. Like, I honestly feel like there's no subtle way to do that, but I mean, Jess Clemen went for it. I would tell her that I respect her for it, but I don't. I like you, Faith. I'm not doing anything with you I don't want to do. And I don't want to leave you. He lifted his arms and dropped them as if helpless. He's like, Ugh. He's like so freaking dramatic. Either we do this thing, you in my bed, me in yours, all night, or we don't. And I try to find a way to like you without burying my face between your legs and making you scream until you cry. I mean, I'm not really into sex scenes where somebody cries, but that would check off one of my predictions, so I freaking hope it happened. In the dark, he grinned. Sex kitten. <laughs> what is that? I don't think that... I don't... What? Just imagine, like, 45-year-old Jessica Lemon sitting out, uh, like, at her summer beach house with her three sons who all play a different sport, drinking, like, a vodka lemonade out by the lake, and she writes, Sex Kitten, unironically. She sends it to her editor, and it got published? 
Hey Siri, what is a sex kitten? I found this on the web. Sex kitten is a woman who exhibits a sexually provocative lifestyle. There are so many scenes where random characters that we don't know and characters that like have no impact on the plot at all will show up and just talk about like past memories they have, which I can only assume is from like other books written by Jessica Lemon, where she's just like doing like a cameo character, which like I understand that, but like when you haven't read all of her books, it's so confusing and it feels like such a waste of time. And this book is already so long as it is. So when it's like two in the morning and you're trying to read this during finals, week it is not very fun and you become very aggressive <laughs> very quickly but something that's annoying too is we'll even have our main characters of this book recount memories that happened earlier in the book where faith and connor will be like yeah like remember when somebody was trying to break into my apartment but that was like 20 pages ago yeah i remember i was there making fun of you the entire way so there's this scene a little bit later on in the book and they're decorating for Christmas. She's like putting up the garland. They're like, you know, decorating the house. It's all like special. And at this point they're like officially like kind of a couple. They did that thing where they like, they don't say that they're a couple, but they like hook up every single chapter and only act like a couple. But then like, of course we get like a scene later in the book where they're like, are we a couple? And it's like, well, I think you freaking are. But we have this scene where they're like decorating for Christmas and talking about Christmassy things. It's really fun. And then guess what? That holly jolly spirit turns into ho 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 if you know what I'm saying because guess what time it is everybody? It's time for sex scene number five. And since this was our first sex scene when it was like around Christmas and like we were decorating for Christmas, I was sitting here and I was like getting ready to read this and I was like, okay, this is it. Call her naughty. This is the scene. She's gonna get called naughty. I was like, Come on, here we go, call her naughty. <laughs> like, at this point, I want you to know the only reason why I continued to read this book is because I was holding out hope for the fact that this man was gonna call her naughty. Um, and then it didn't happen. There's nothing notable about this scene at all besides the fact that I wanted to, um, what's the word? Oh yeah, die. 10 pages later, guess what time it is, everybody? It's actually time for Connor to get emotionally vulnerable. He like talks about how he was in the war and how he's like so upset about that and how he has like so much trauma because of that. It's really heartfelt. I'm not gonna read any of it just because I don't want to. But then randomly after he gets vulnerable, it's time for sex scene number six. Yay, yay, yay. I was so ready for that, right? Like it is a little bit uncomfortable to watch a character like open up and be vulnerable and then like within one page they just start having sex like it's like very uncomfortable um but like he wasn't angry and she didn't cry so i don't care much about it there's just this scene and they're like cooking dinner and they're just talking and then faith is randomly like wow We've been having all this unprotected sex and I haven't got my period. I might be pregnant. <laughs> Not only does this plot line come out of nowhere because it's just like, wow, I might be with child. And it's like, wait a second. Can you hold back a second? Like we've literally like only had sex scenes and you casually mention the fact that you're probably pregnant. That's uncomfortable for a lot of reasons. I feel like there's such a subtle way to do this where like maybe they eat dinner and she starts to feel really sick and she's like, wait, a second like there is that one time that we just didn't use protection because we're grown adults and we're responsible maybe i'm pregnant like that would be a good scene but like it turns out it's just like she ate some like nasty freaking seafood i guess um okay and if you're wondering how connor feels about all of this he doesn't really seem to care he's just like oh wow and that's literally the extent of it but they're literally just like wow i guess we're gonna have a baby then that's pretty, that's fine, I guess. So instead of immediately taking a pregnancy test just to make sure, um, she decides that she's gonna keep the audience in suspense for a couple of chapters. The two of them for Christmas are like going out. I don't remember the series of events that follows, but somehow the two of them like end up in a cabin together and then they get snowed in at the cabin. Then they're like, oh wow, I guess that's convenient. We're gonna have to spend Christmas together in this cabin. And so they're in this cabin and it's 
it's like really cold in there and whatever and like it's really it's like really boring <laughs> it's like so stupid like at this point you're just like why are we not taking a freaking pregnancy test like you're just saying the most concerning things about how your life is going to be ruined and then you're just like anyways it's time to eat some food. And you're like, okay, but like, what? My favorite part is when Faith is complaining about how cold it is in the cabin. And then Connor says, I'll keep you warm, Cupcake. He wrapped his arms around her waist and tugged her back against his body. And then for some reason, Connor offers her a glass of wine. But like, he knows that she might be pregnant, but he's just like, hey, you want some wine? I feel like he's trying to like secretly like mutate this child. But then she wasn't willing to drink alcohol until she found out if there is a baby in her uterus, <laughs> which like true, right? Like maybe there is a baby in her uterus. Like that's not factually incorrect. But why do they talk like that? It's just things like that where it's not a big deal and it's not a critique, but it makes it harder to read and harder to flow naturally because it's like, who says that? When you think about it for more than one second, it bothers you. And maybe I'm just petty, but like I have a problem with it. Okay, so finally, I feel like 50 pages after we get this reveal that they've had unprotected sex and that she might be pregnant, we finally get the follow-up where she takes the test. And I'm so very excited. Let's read. Halfway across the room, the bathroom door opened. Then she looked up, her eyes red and leaking tears. Without hesitation, he rushed to her. A moment later, he was holding her against him, her cheeks wetting his neck as her fingers clawed into his shirt. <laughs> like a freaking rat. So he says in a very like natural way, let's sit down, sweetness. <laughs> she just has such a sugar addiction. I can't help it. Negative, she whispers. I don't know why I'm crying. I thought I'd be relieved. The timing, it's wrong. And we, I mean, we don't. She shrugged, not knowing how to relay what she was thinking. He says, we don't have any plans to stay together. This was a life sentence, he guessed. How romantic. Yeah threading his finger, that was a really good line of dialogue. Threading his fingers into her hair, he said, but it doesn't sound like a bad life sentence. It sounded almost wonderful, they said at the same time. Is this a Hallmark movie? So she says that she doesn't wanna be pregnant because it's uncertain and it would be irresponsible and that the life of the baby would probably not be that great because her parents are like terrible freaking people. But then once she finds out she's not pregnant, she gets all emo about it and suddenly both of them desperately want a child, even though earlier they're like, it would not be a great idea to have a child. So what do you think is gonna happen? Because Faith is crying and we're both really upset because this could have been really special and like she's starting to realize that maybe she does want to settle down with this bad boy and maybe this is a path that she wants so what do you think we're gonna do are we gonna continue to have a scene where we talk through how we feel or are we gonna have sex scene where he angry slash she cry. He's not angry, but she cry. Then he laid her down in a pile of blankets covering the couch, stripped her bare, made love to her slow and long until they came in unison, came the same way they did everything <laughs> together. Wow, we. It's just uncomfortable because instead of having like a scene where we grow as characters and we express the way that we feel and all of that, we just get a scene where he's like, okay, I guess I'll have sex with you while you're crying. We don't get any implications that she doesn't want to have sex, but like, why are we crying? Why, why don't we clean ourselves off? Maybe we'll like take a breather, make some dinner or something, but no, we're just gonna do it wipe those tears away and get ready to party. So while we're chilling in this cabin, we just get to talking and bad boy decides that it's time to talk more about his backstory because of course it is. So we find out that like he was dating this girl and then like she was like, I'm pregnant. And then he was like, oh wow, I'm gonna be a father. And then she had the baby and then she's like, haha, it's not yours. And they never even relate it to the fact that Faith wanted to be pregnant. And then like, they just had a pregnancy scare. He's just like, on a completely unrelated note, one time I got a girl pregnant and then it wasn't even mine. You can make it tie in and you can make it mean something, but like this, these books aren't edited. So it's literally just like, I got a girl pregnant once. I was pretty upset. Um, and I know that you thought you were pregnant and you were also upset, but we're not gonna dive into that. 
So while we're trapped in this cottage, we don't have any decorations for Christmas, which is just so upsetting. So Connor decides in bad boy fashion to go out into the blizzard and cut down a tree and then bring it into the cottage. And like it's played off as so romantic, but he's just like an idiot. She's like, where are you going? We have plenty of firewood. And he's like, I'm getting you a tree. So a little while later, he brings back the Christmas tree and he like sets it up and like they don't have ornaments obviously. So they like start to try to decorate it and they like put like their underwear on it which is like so very hot by the way and my favorite line from this section just says our christmas tree is turning me on his voice reverberated off her rib cage retweet if your christmas tree turns you on we only have like 50 60 pages left in this book so i'm like holding my breath each page being like okay call her naughty like come on. like we don't have much time call her naughty we're running out of time i'm sweating bullets i am holding my breath every single time i turn the page i'm like deflating getting more and more tense like we're running out of time and in the next chapter guess what time it is everybody it's time for a monumental sex scene number eight which means my prediction came true we had at least eight sex scenes so i guess that's not absurd at all let's read some of the subtlety of sex scene number eight for you he stopped tonguing her and kissed her lips tonguing tonguing what was he tonguing her mouth oh i think he would oh oh she was panting which made him very pleased she's like <sighs> She's cosplaying as Gertie during this sex scene, which I appreciated. Bend over the table, he instructed. That sounds, she smiled. Eyebrows lifted, he waited. Naughty. Da -da -da -da, we did it, y'all. He called her naughty. Did it, we did it. He called her naughty. <laughs> he called her naughty. He called her <laughs> When I tell you that I read that at like three in the morning, and like for some reason I decided it was time for celebration, and they start to give each other gifts. And I have the unfortunate job of bringing you the news that Faith does not put a Christmas bow on herself and then say, I am the gift. And then they have sex. Um, but no, we get a scene where they give each other the dumbest gifts ever. She says, open your silly present. How silly could it be? He tore at the paper, revealed his gift, and promptly laughed. Laughed so hard, his stomach hurt, <laughs> and tears pricked his eyes. Whatever is in here is hilarious. It's so funny that he is actually crying, that this man is sobbing laughing. For the first time, this man has expressed emotion, okay? Besides just, like, panic and fear, honestly. What do you think is in here? A chia pet. Get it? <laughs> Cause I know I sure freaking don't. Cupcake, he held up the box. You bought me a chia pet. Like it? No. Her face faltered. I love it. And he loved her. She got him like a Garfield freaking like, <laughs> like chia pet. And they're just like having this moment where they're like, Babe, I love you. Wow. And like, why was he crying at that? That is like not funny at all. And so Connor gets up. He like stands up. And he's like, get over here. And I thought that he was going to like, maybe like murder her. But no. And then she says, I can't have any more sex today. And I'm like, me too. Please. Like there's been literally eight sex scenes within 50 pages of each other. I need a break. Not what I want, he said. When she nestled into the crook of his arm. What do you want? She says. He gave her a light squeeze. This. <laughs> so he's just like, love you. Thanks for the Garfield. You want to know the way to a bad boy's heart? Just, just get him a chia pet. You know what I'm saying? So there's this character named Jonas, who I've talked about him a little bit. He was with Connor in Afghanistan. They served together. They were close friends. They both live in Evergreen Cove and every single Friday they meet up and they like have like a 
hang out together. And so randomly out of nowhere, literally out of nowhere, which is like every single plot point in this book, there's like a phone call and they're like, oh, by the way, Jonas killed himself. And I'm not gonna talk much about it. It goes on for like maybe like 10, 15 pages. And so you might be like, wow, this is gonna be a big deal for Connor's character. I thought we were gonna really unpack the emotional weight of serving in the war and what that means for you know people who have served and more specifically what this means for connor because this was his close friend and we we're also gonna have connor talk about like yeah i feel that same way all the time i've seen so much messed up stuff that could be a really great opportunity for connor to be like yo i struggle with similar things that's why i have a hard time getting close to you that's why i feel so weirdly protective of you it would have been justified and it would have made for a stronger story but no we don't get that. The entire reason why this character um, unfortunately killed himself is so that we can have a scene where Connor realizes that life is too short and that he's gonna ask Faith to live with him in his house. So Connor asks Faith if she wants to live with him and then he proceeds to get furious at her for no reason. In or out, Faith, he was still frowning. She blinked at him. In his frown intensified or out. And so obviously this is a really big decision. She has this apartment, she probably has her own life, all of her own stuff going on, and the idea of suddenly picking all of her stuff up and moving into this random dude's house. He's not random. They've had sex approximately eight times, but the idea of randomly moving in with this dude for no reason out of the blue is probably a lot to process. He says, too soon. His voice had no tone. She says, for us to get a house. And he says, but not to have sex, have a baby. She says, I'm not pregnant. He says, no. Guess it's a good thing too, since you're half out already. Excuse me, she said, suddenly angry. You can't expect to come in here and tell me we're moving in together and just expect me to comply. Okay, girl, ooh. But he just keeps getting angry and saying like, I need an answer now. Even though it's not a pressing matter at all, a normal person would be like, yo, if it takes you a couple days to figure it out and try to, you know, get things sorted out with your apartment. But no, he just lashes out at her and continues to scream at her. He's saying like, I loved you. And she's like, okay, but like, I just am not ready to, and he's like, you're done. I'm, you're not wanting to move in with me. Then he like slams the door and leaves. And maybe this entire reason for all of this is because bad boy is really upset that his friend killed himself. But like, we don't hear any of that. We literally just have him say like, wow, that's really upsetting that this guy killed himself. Um, please move in with me. You don't wanna do that? Idiot, I used to love you and now I'm sad. He's mad for no reason. The only reason he's mad is because this is the point of the story where he's supposed to be mad at her and they're supposed to break things off so that five pages later we can have this moment where they realize that they're in love with each other and then they have like this big reunion and then like they decide they're gonna be together forever. Um, you know how I know that? Because I freaking read it already. And like all these books are so formulaic where it's literally so annoying to read because it's just like, sex and then like screaming and like just bad men you know what i'm saying so like 10 pages later and at this point we have like five pages left in this book um we have this scene and it's new year's eve it's time to you know be at a party where everybody's gonna kiss at midnight and guess who conveniently decides to show up to this party together connor is there and who else is also there Faith. Wow, I never would have been able to guess that, right? And like their big falling out happened like three or four days after Christmas, which means it's been like a day or two after this that it's this scene is happening at the end of the book where it's New Year's Eve. Five, four. And then she says, this isn't how I wanted to do this. Three, me neither, he says. Two, his lips closed over her as the shout of Happy New Year rang from the house. In tandem, they sighed. I have missed that, he muttered, but it's been like a literal day. <laughs> the two characters decide that they're gonna like fall in love now and everything's fine. Did we just have a big fight? Yes, we did. Did we just have one of the close friends of this character commit suicide? Yes, we did. Are we gonna unpack any of that? You know, try to grow from it or like talk about the themes in the writing? No way, we ain't got time for that. But you know what we do have time for? An epilogue. Marry me, she said. He blew out a deep sigh. You ruin everything.
What? Her mouth dropped open. I do not. His tongue darted out of his wet lips. He's like, Kermit the freaking frog. Your engagement ring is on top of my dresser drawer. I was going to ask you this weekend. Really? Really? So I don't have to get pregnant to snare you? Cute, right? Cupcake, he embraced her. You snared me a long time ago. When she lifted her face from his, he found him smiling. A baby. Our baby. So, are you in or out? In. And he kissed her for a long time. Why? That's not cute at all. They bring back the like, are you in or out thing from 10 pages ago when he was screaming at her for no reason. And for some reason in this context, it's like romantic, but like we didn't solve that conflict. It's like wide open. Like I'm not down with this cause that's freaking not okay. Their relationship began at the end of November after Thanksgiving. And so the final scenes of this book takes place on Valentine's Day, which mean they've been together for three months and they've already moved in with each other, gotten engaged, and now they're having a child, which is not, you know what? I don't wanna talk about it. Good to see that you're all in, yeah. She was all in. And soon, so was Connor. And that's the end of the friggin' book. <laughs> this book was upsetting to me for a lot of reasons. The main reason being the fact that it barely even took place during Christmas time and that I spent so many hours reading this and now filming this and, um, Apparently for no reason because I thought that this book was gonna be full of like stupid Christmas stuff And then it barely even was and the things that were Christmas were barely even Christmas related. So Was it worth it? My biggest issue with this book is the fact that there's no semblance of like a plot Because like we start out and we're doing nothing and then we have the whole like break-in Subplot that like barely goes anywhere and it's like once it's resolved like there it's just over with we never hear about it. It doesn't impact the characters. All it does is bring Connor and Faith together, which is weird because they were already mutual friends seemingly for years before this book even started. And then they just stay together and then they're like have sex like so many times and then they scream at each other and then they're in love now. Yeah, that's the whole book for you. I mentioned this in my other bad boy video, I think, but I just say one of the biggest downfall of this book and of just books like this is just the dialogue and the weird freaking descriptions. Dialogue is where you get to know your characters and you can convey like different ways that they talk um, or like some characters are more jokey, others are more proper, some are really laid back. But in this book, they all talk like weird, like overly formal robots where they're like, yes, I will indeed have sex with you. Take down those pants. And you're like, what? It's just really hard to get through and the writing doesn't flow, which is something that makes books uh, enjoyable sometimes. It is very strange because in my notes from when I finished this, I wrote, Connor was never pushy towards her. But like, I think I freaking changed my mind because I probably was on some hard dope if when I wrote that because what the frick? All the characters are forgettable or just irrelevant. And um, again, bad boy is just so annoying. I'm over it. Shut up, rat boy. Although I do think this book is stupid and I have problems with the writing and with the characters and with a lot of the themes and I just think that as a whole it's a complete mess, it's not lost on me why these books have value to a lot of people and it's not lost on me why these books are so beloved by so many people. I think that these are like the hallmark movies of publishing where like as a whole we can say that they're not that great, they have like low budgets, but like people just wanna like throw them on like have some fun for like a couple hours, like laugh, you know, get some like tinglings in the pee pee if you know what I'm saying. I understand that these books are supposed to be very stereotypical with no plot and a lot of sex just so um, people can like insert themselves. I feel like the reason that stereotypes exist in the first place is just so it's an easier reading experience where you're like, oh, I know who he is. I know everything about him. But when you actually read it in the context of this book, you're like, I have no idea who this man is and uh, I do not like him. But that's all of my thoughts about a bad boy for Christmas. Anyway, 
anyways, it's time for me to sell out. I do have a Patreon. If you want to have extra content, I post an extra video on there every single month, which admittedly at this point is double the content because I seemingly only post one video a month. I'm gonna go be naughty, I guess. See y'all later. Bye. Make my wish come true. I do have a pitch for Jessica Lemon. If she wants to do a spin-off book of Bad Boy for Christmas, here's the idea. Listen to me real close. Whore for Hanukkah.